Okay, good afternoon, and um, I'm expecting good morning. Um, uh, you're all very welcome to the School of Nursing and Midwifery in Trinity College in Dublin. And uh, you're here, of course, for the Boston College, Trinity College Dublin Research Blitz. Um, I want to welcome in particular uh, Professor Christopher Lee, the Dean of, of Nursing in Connell School, in Boston College. Uh, I want to welcome his colleagues who are here. Uh, and I also want to welcome my own colleagues here and the students in particular, but who are present here and also those of you who are joining us uh, from, from, the, from Boston College. Um, I was just discussing briefly with, uh, with, with Chris about the uh, building here. And we, we, we have a, an unusual sort of art deco building which was great for its purpose back in the old days when uh, we had smaller numbers of students and staff, but it's quite confining now, but it brings a great character. And I recall my visit to Connell's uh, school, school um, many years ago in Boston uh, for an Ananda International uh, event that I was involved in and the welcome I got there, but also the, the character and the nature of the, war, the warmth that there was within the school. And with a name like Connell, I, I know that that carries links between uh, forefathers of people who set up the school there and, and this country. And so I'm, I'm delighted to welcome Chris and to welcome you here. And I know Chris is going to say a few words as well. I look forward in particular to hearing the, the students of both colleges presenting on their work. Thank you very much, Benton. And I'd like to add my warm welcome from Boston College. So good afternoon, if those of you in Dublin and good morning, those of you in Boston. Uh, on behalf of Dean Gregory and all of our colleagues at Boston College, it's a great privilege to share our second experience with you in exchange between the Trinity uh, College of Dublin School of Nursing and Midwifery and the William F. Canal School of Nursing. The research blitzes are um, particularly challenging for early career scientists like those who will be presenting today and even senior scientists. The sentinel challenge being to keep your work to five minutes, which is almost impossible for academics. So we'll do our best. Um, we have enabled um, question and answers, and those are for prosperity's sake primarily. This is such a short um, period of time that this will be recorded, and um, we will hope that presenters will have the opportunity to reflect and respond on those questions um, after the event today. So without further ado, I'd love to invite our first speaker up to the podium. So hope you can all see me. Diva uh, Khorja. Hello everyone, um, my name is Lisa Kerwin. I'm an assistant professor in children's nursing here at the School of Nursing Midwifery TCG. And I'm delighted to have been invited to speak about my PhD study called the eCare Study. First, I'd like to thank the School of Nursing Midwifery here for providing me with the scholarship to carry out my PhD part-time over the next six years. I'm currently in year one. I'd also like to acknowledge Professor Melda Coyne, who is my supervisor and has been so helpful with my project so far. And I'd like you all to meet Connor. Connor is a 13 year old boy who was admitted to the accident and emergency department of a children's hospital in Dublin with suicidal ideation and self harm. And Connor requires specialist treatment to manage his mental health difficulty. However, there is no availability for him to receive this treatment elsewhere. And unfortunately, Connor is just like many other young people and adolescents in Ireland who are requiring admissions to acute pediatric hospitals in Ireland for the management of a number of mental health difficulties such as eating disorders, suicidal ideation, self-harm, anxiety and depression. And this is because the incidence of mental health difficulties among adolescents is rising. And there has been a 526% increase in the number of adolescents with mental health difficulties being treated and uh, admitted to acute paediatric services in Ireland over the last 10 years. And why is this? Um, we think it may be because specialist mental health services in Ireland for young people are currently underfunded and fragmented. And therefore, acute paediatric services and healthcare professionals such as nurses are often the first point of contact and are a major source of support for adolescents with mental health difficulties in Ireland. However, um, there is very, very little evidence available on this topic, particularly qualitative research and research from Ireland. 
Um, there's some evidence to suggest that nurses in particular find this patient group very challenging to care for. And there's also some evidence to suggest that adolescents and their families as well find uh, are often dissatisfied with the mental health care that they receive in p acute pediatric services. And therefore, um, that's why I would like to explore the experiences of care for adolescents with mental health difficulties in the acute pediatric setting in Ireland, which is the focus of my study. So the first phase, and um, that's ongoing at the moment, I'm currently in data analysis phase is a mixed method systematic review. I've published my protocol on Prospero, a database for six systematic reviews that you can look up. The ID is on the slide there. And I'm very lucky to have a great team behind me to help me with my review. Greg Sheaf, who's a librarian here at uh, Trinity College, Aoife Aprianti, a fellow PhD student, and she's primary reviewer, and my supervisor, Professor Amelda Coyne, who is the second reviewer. Um, and I hope that this review will help me to map the quality of evidence available on this topic and to inform the empirical phase of my project. So the empirical phase will involve a descriptive phenomenological design of semi-structured interviews in person and digitally with nurses, student nurses, parents and adolescents to explore their experiences of care on this about this patient group. Um, and participants will be recruited by via a children's hospital in Ireland and also via social media. And patient and public involvement will be a really important part of this project. I'm currently um, creating an advisory panel of young people and stakeholders who will help me throughout the research process. And ultimately, what I really hope from this project is that the findings will help inform recommendations that could lead to better care for this really vulnerable patient group in Ireland. I hope to share the findings with stakeholders and participants in relevant conferences published in high impact journals. But ultimately, what I really hope comes out from this is that I'm able to create a resource to help healthcare, healthcare professionals like nurses to support them in their care of these, uh, these patients. Um, and maybe at some point do postdoctoral study on this topic, but that's way, way, way down the line. Um, so thank you all for listening, Ger Margot. Um, my email there is on the slide. You can follow me or you can follow my study on X, aka Twitter. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Way to start us off to a wonderful trajectory today. So our next speaker is um, David Geyer. And David, you can unmute yourself and um, take over when you're ready. Please let me know when you'd like me to advance your slides. OK, thank you so much. Um, so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. My name is David Geyer. I am a pediatric nurse and nurse practitioner and a third year doctoral candidate at the Canal School of Nursing. And my presentation is titled Confronting Bureaucracy, Examining Systemic Challenges of Caring for Children with Medical Complexity at Home. My research has actually been inspired by my role as a pediatric home care nurse in which I have cared for some of the most medically complex children in the U.S. And what has always struck me is not only how much responsibility the parents of these children take on, but how unsupported these parents feel. And as the title of this New York Times article from earlier this year captures, this lack of support can be very disruptive to parental well-being. Next slide, please. Children with medical complexity are defined by the presence of one or more chronic conditions that not only disrupts the functioning of their body systems, but warrants the use of medical technology like ventilators and feeding tubes and extensive care coordination. In the last 40 years, the care of these children has really focused on allowing them to live at home. Uh, there are approximately 1.5 million children with medical complexity living in the US, and this number continues to grow year after year thanks to medical advancements. Parents of these children are often the ones responsible for taking over the care coordination once these children come home, which includes a multitude of responsibilities, including setting up appointments, learning how to use medical equipment, and providing direct nursing care. Studies evaluating the experiences of these parental caregivers have concluded that they experience significant caregiver burden and subsequently negative health outcomes, including depression and physical injury. There's been particular focus in the literature on how specific chronic conditions are more burdensome than others, but ultimately the overall message remains consistent. The complexities of a child's disease processes are directly responsible for the burden parents experience. Next slide, please. 
The goal of my research is actually to shift the way in which clinicians and researchers think about parental caregiver burden. A linear relationship between a child's disease and the burden a parent feels disregards the entire caring process of these parents. Certainly, the physical labor of caring can prove to be strenuous, but there's an entire healthcare system that literally and figuratively surrounds these parents and dictates the quality of care they are able to provide their children. This system includes home care nurses, medical equipment companies, inpatient and outpatient specialists, insurance providers, and healthcare policies. These elements directly affect the care parents can provide their children, but as I alluded to earlier, parents are often left feeling unsupported by this system. Yet, little has been done to explore how challenges within this system impact feelings of burden among parental caregivers. Therefore, my work has been examining the relationship between systemic challenges and caregiver burden more closely using Ray's theory of bureaucratic caring as a framework. And this theory describes an underlying interconnectedness between spiritual ethical caring and elements of a bureaucratic healthcare system. When this interconnectedness exists in harmony, the elements of a bureaucracy, which are found in the outer ring of the model, can support effective high quality caring. I propose that in the case of these parents, the absence of this harmony is the driving force of their feelings of burden. Thus far, I have completed two studies to examine this relationship. In my integrative review, I wanted to see if current literature on parental caregiver experiences describes the systemic challenges that parents face. And if it does, which elements of bureaucracy as defined by the framework do these challenges fall under? Across the 10 identified articles, systemic challenges across all seven of the bureaucratic elements were identified, supporting my hypothesis that some type of relationship between systemic challenges and parental caregiver burden exists. Through my case control secondary analysis, I was able to further evaluate this relationship by quantifying caregiver burden and identifying any associations this burden has with the bureaucratic elements of the theory. Compared to an identical cohort of nearly 700 parents who do not have a child with medical complexity, burden among parents who do was found to be significantly higher and associated with multiple bureaucratic elements, providing additional evidence that systemic challenges have an effect on feelings of caregiver burden. Up next will be a qualitative study interviewing parents that live within a single state in the United States about their experiences of caring for their child with medical complexity that will be guided by the bureaucratic caring framework, as well as using process mapping to visually describe the system in which they are caring for their children. Next slide. In summary, parents of children with medical complexity in the United States are providing care within a complex bureaucratic system. The challenges they face in caring for their children stem from weaknesses within the system, which disrupt the harmony of bureaucratic caring and have been associated with feelings of parental caregiver burden. Therefore, efforts to decrease this burden must look beyond disease processes and focus on systemic interventions. Thank you. All right, excellent job, David. Thank you very much. Next up is Dan Fitzpatrick. Uh, hello, uh, good evening and good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Fitzpatrick, and my study is in uh, mental health in the military. Uh, so it's a mixed methods investigation of mental health and health seeking behaviors in the Irish Defense Forces. But because of the time limitation, I have uh, reduced the slideshow down into sort of bite-sized chunks in the format of a who, why, what, and how. So we begin with uh, who am I? Well, I used to be that guy. Uh, 22 years of military service in the Irish Air Corps, recently retired, hence the beard. Um, and in that time, I worked as a health provider for social, financial, emotional, psychological needs <coughs> of soldiers. It's a unit called the Personnel Support Service. And... Uh, before that, I was a, a medic as well, so I've had a very kind of um, non-military type of uh, career. Um, and uh, I've served overseas in Syria, Libya, Lebanon and uh, Israel. So I anecdotally know how soldiers behave and what sort of mental health um, issues and experiences they, they, they have. So that's what... The basis for the study was and um why i wanted to do this is because when when i looked at the the literature we see that uh just by being in the uh, military that you um are at a heightened risk of experiencing poor mental health and 
a lot of people would say, oh, well, the Irish military, you know, we're not involved in combat and that sort of thing. But in the literature, there's a lot of um, uh, issues that happen in peacekeeping missions. And the Irish Defence Forces have been involved in Irish peacekeeping missions since 1958. And some of the literature says that some of the peacekeeping missions are as traumatic as combat missions. And they cite Rwanda all the time. So when they, the, the UN were in Rwanda, um, there was a, the, the highest amount of suicides in the Canadian army uh, came out of that, that mission. Um, so uh, peacekeeping veterans, uh, as well as combat veterans, display long-term psychiatric disorders. And it was interesting to me that uh, there, was, there wasn't much literature, if any, um, about Irish soldiers and what happens to those, uh, what happens to us and, and our experiences. So that is the why. Um, so what I'm doing, so mixed methods research. So I chose a sequential explanatory mixed methods design that composes the two phases. So phase one was to develop, design, and distribute a survey um, that, that uh, captured um, uh, data on anxiety, depression, alcohol consumption, suicide attempts, deliberate self-harm, PTSD, in addition to stigma and help-seeking behaviours. So it's kind of broken up into two parts. Um, and uh, yeah, so how am I doing it? So the research is the first of its kind and encompasses the three branches of the Irish military. So it, it was actually it was, it was quite a difficult process to get this survey out there and get people to complete it because it was it's about 20 pages long, it takes about 15 minutes. And if uh, any of anyone who knows soldiers they don't like filling in forms, so it was quite difficult uh to, to get it done um the study was open to all ranks uh, and included a third gender category which is the first re or first military research of its kind the irish defense forces to have a gender outside female and male um and it uh, it comes both uh, so the two rank systems that are are, are named this are officers and other ranks so typically in in the literature in mental health very difficult to get responses from officers as they have the higher uh, sort of responsibility within the defense forces or, 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 or all military. So it's typically for, uh, difficult to get them to engage. Um, uh, the survey was created on a digital platform and distributed to military.ie. So military.ie is a website and it's a private members. So anyone who was in the military could log in, log in to private members in military.ie and uh, complete the survey. Uh, it was over 800 responses um, and that is about 7% of the total population of the defense forces. And it was split somewhere like 500 enlisted and the rest were officers so nearly 200 officers so it was a good uh, it was a very good response um how am i doing it so phase two then was the interview so once the data was um collected correlated and analyzed through spss uh it went to uh key findings then were presented to um key stakeholders in the organization which was even more difficult than distributing the survey it was finding people to talk about uh, the findings um so uh, some of the key stakeholders I tried to get were the chief of staff, director of medical corps, director of personnel support service, the DF clinical psychologist, the DF psychiatrist, and the senior regimental sergeant major. Now, um, the only one on that list that I haven't got so far is the chief of staff, everyone else I, I managed to get. Um, and uh, so, some of those conversations were, were, were quite difficult, um, but that's the phase that I'm on now at the moment is analyzing those. So the integration of the qualitative and quantitative data produced the overall findings, um, which I'll talk about briefly. So some of the findings, um, anxiety, uh, there was severe cases of anxiety with 19%, depression, severe 21%, PTSD, there was a discovery of 25% of total respondents, suicide attempts, 9%, suicide ideation, 36%, self-harm, 11%. And then in the help seeking um, part of the survey, there were questions like, uh, would you disclose a mental health issue to a military uh, mental uh, a military officer? And your military officer is your designated GP, so you, you have to use a military officer. And 80% of respondents said, no, they wouldn't. Um, but on, on a positive note, one of the questions was, is a soldier living with a uh, mental health issue fit to serve in the defense force? And 95, 94% uh, of respondents agreed that they were. So it begs the question, you know, do we self stigmatize and and uh, um, is, is the culture to blame or, or are we to blame or that's where the investigation lies and there's some of the questions that are being asked to the key stakeholders. 
So um, researching military populations has its challenges. Uh, the research had mixed interest in defense forces. Some people want to know the answers and some people don't. Um, all participants have been very honest. Um, and overall, it has been a positive experience. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that wonderful talk. Next up, we have Danielle Walker. Danielle, when you're ready, you can unmute and then just please let me know when you'd like me to advance your slides. Okay. Um, so I'm Danielle Walker. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the Carnot School of Nursing. Um, my research study is called uh, Community Violence Exposure and Black Emerging Adults with Psychotic Disorders, and I'm using a uh, phenomenological approach. Um, my research is really inspired by my work as a psychiatric nurse practitioner um, at Boston Medical Center, or BMC, here in Boston. Um, at BMC, I work in the Wellness and Recovery After Psychosis program, um, which is a program where we work with those with first episode psychosis, as well as those with chronic psychotic disorders. And so I'm hoping to do, I'm working, currently working on a qualitative study. Um, I initially published an integrative review um, looking at the mental and physical health um, impact of community violence exposure and Black emerging adults. And one of the health outcomes showed that there's an increase in psychotic symptoms in those um, being exposed to community violence. And so now moving on um, to the qualitative study. So my purpose is to really understand the impact of community violence exposure in Black emerging adults. And emerging adults is ages 18 to 29, um, those with psychotic disorders. My research questions um, are like, what are the lived experiences of those? Um, black emerging adults with psychotic disorders who've been exposed to community violence, and also how does the experience of community violence impact their um, daily lives as emerging adults? Next. And so some background. So in the U.S., uh, community violence exposure is a public health crisis. Um, rates of violence um, were increasing. They're kind of steadying down now um, in the U.S., but homicides did increase uh, almost 30% um, from 2019 to 2020, um, and then another additional 5% from 2020 to 2021. Um, Black emerging adults are more at risk for violence exposure. Approximately 35 out of 1,000 Black emerging adults are victims of violence here in the U.S. And then on top of that, Black emerging adults are also more likely to be diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. And those with psychotic disorders, research has shown that they're actually more likely to be victims of violence. And so with all of this, really wanted to look at the um, experiences that um, uh, these Black emerging adults with psychotic disorders have. And then history of systemic and structural racism is a big factor that has increased violence in Black communities here in the U.S. Next. And so the um, conceptual framework that I'm using, it's not really guiding my actual study. It really just kind of helped guide my um, my uh, semi-structured uh, questionnaire um, is Arnett's theory of emerging uh, adulthood. This is a psychologist and he coined this term emerging adulthood, which is a period um, in between adolescence and adulthood. It's characterized by instability, feeling really in between, um, where uh, the person is really focused on their self and their goals. Um, and despite all this instability um, and feeling unsure, it's also a period of uh, possibility and a lot of hope. Next. And so my study design, so I'm using a descriptive um, phenomenology approach. I do have semi-structured interviews and all my participants are being recruited from Boston Medical Center's um, RAP program, which is the psychosis program. Uh, currently, I'm hoping to get between seven to 20. Currently, I do have eight. I completed eight interviews um, so far, and it's been really, really good data so far, but hoping to get some more participants until I reach saturation. Um, been hitting some snags with interviewing because I'm interviewing a population that may naturally be paranoid. Um, and so having some struggles with that, but hopefully get some more people soon. Next. And so I'm hoping to really increase the understanding of potential health disparities um, in this population and really um, understand how community violence impacts them. And then hopefully have um, some interventions um, aimed at health equity for Black emerging adults um, with psychotic disorders. That's it. Great job, Daniel. 
Thank you very much. Um, hello, uh, good morning, Boston, and hello, everyone online uh, as well. My name is Katja Ketisavolainen. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student here in Trinity, um, and I'll be talking about my PhD study that is completed. Uh, I'm at the stage of where I just have to write the whole thing, <laughs> finish the thesis. Um, I'm looking at a uh, discourse of human rights of all the people in long-term care, and in my study, it is predominantly uh, nursing homes. And I'm using a uh, Foucaulty and a critical discourse analysis. And my study was a qualitative interview study with residents, family members, and staff. And just a quick, this is a busy slide, but just to mention uh, the framework. So I am interested in language in action or how we construct our world, social construction. And I'm basing it on Michel Foucault's work uh, on um, finding the hidden truths in language. And he was particularly interested in the power knowledge relationship. Um, who, uh, where does the knowledge stem from and who, who, who is speaking and, and, and so forth. Um, I got ethics approval in August 21. And then I had three nursing homes part of the recruitment. And I added even a fourth one in September 22. Um, due to COVID-19 restrictions, uh, delayed some of the recruitment. So I ended up with 43 participants. Um, the majority of, of um, my participants um, participated through semi-structured interviews. Um, I had 17 older people, residents in nursing homes. I had 15 staff members. They were both nurses and healthcare assistants working in nursing homes. And I have 11 family members, uh, which of five were individual interviews and, um, and six attended one focus group. The significant uh, in the data collection was the fact that nursing homes in Ireland at this particular time, November 21 to February 2022, still had quite strict public health uh, restrictions, which, which um, uh, impacted my data collection. And all uh, transcriptions um, were analyzed and uh, using the Foucault and critical discourse analysis and uh, three main discourses um, were, were discovered. Uh, protection discourse, which stems from keeping the older person safe, um, stems from paternalistic care. Conditional rights, which means that the rights are conditioned to the older person. They are adapted to the older person in nursing home. And a governance discourse, which looks at the whole um, power element from institutional rules, um, governmentality and how the long-term care um, system is, is set up. Although it's three main um, discourses, they are enmeshed in a very complex system of, of power relationship uh, between um, different um, sources, um, driven mainly by paternalism and ageism, um, where there is institutional rules and a normalization through nurses' assessment that either restrict or um, assist the older person in their, in their human rights. So findings and conclusions. In looking at critical discourse analysis and the subject positioning of the older person, what happens is that the older person in nursing homes is um, a, we apply othering to it. And othering is a concept of where we place them in a separate group than the rest of the population. So the human rights that would apply to the rest of the population might, may, may not apply to, to them. Or knowledge of human rights, not just human rights applied to care, but human rights in general is poor among staff particularly. And even knowing um, concepts such as autonomy created confusion and they did not know how to define this. And there is a strong governmentality and power, stru power structures through biopower in how our systems are built up in, 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 uh, in nursing homes are built within the system. So my conclusions recommendation is bridge that knowledge gap. And in order to bridge that knowledge gap, there's a range of uh, recommendations, not just training and education, but a discussion and awareness to um, advocacy and advocacy should be much more legislative and a structured process for the older person to be given a voice. And human rights in long-term care is a, lot, is a priority. 
And it's not only a statement in a policy and through this awareness and advocacy, hopefully we'll be able to give that older person a voice and then strengthen their human rights. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for another wonderful presentation. Next, we have Jackie Massaro. Jackie, when you're ready, you can unmute and let me know when you'd like me to advance your slides. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning. My name is Jackie Massaro. I am a first year PhD student at Boston College, and I um, have the privilege to be able to present uh, to this audience about the important topic of skin health in older persons. There are major implications of the aging population as we shift from more acute to chronic conditions. Aging in general is associated with progressive loss of function, um, functional reserve in all organs, including skin. Next slide. The skin is the largest organ of the body. It comprises 10 to 15% of our, our total body weight, and it's arguably the most complex organ. It performs a multitude of functions, and to name a few example, it is a, it's a barrier, physical and chemical barrier, preventing pathogen invasion to our bodies. It regulates our body temperature with its blood supply. It facilitates the perception of many sensations such as pain, itching, and heat. And its extensive arterials and capillary beds play a role in cardiovascular dynamics, helping with, to maintain our blood pressure. This graphic shows a number of biological changes which the structure of skin undergoes as we age, uh, many of which impair its adaptive and homeostatic capacity, as well as its response to mechanical and physiologic stressors. Um, take, for example, the flattening of the epidermal uh, dermal junction. It's the space between where the top layer, the epidermis, and the dermal layer, the middle layer, attach to one another. In the younger uh, slide, in the younger cross section, you can see the finger like projections, which really root the outer layer to the inner layer of the skin. And as we age to the right, you can see that there's a flattening to that juncture. And that means that the skin is no longer attached very well to one to each other. And the top layer uh, separates easily from the bottom layer. We see this often uh, observed as skin tears in the elderly patients. Skin breakdown is associated with high costs, both functionally and financially, and the aging population is increasing worldwide dramatically. Today in Ireland, people who are 60 years or older represent one in four adults, and this is projected to double over the next 30 years. Whereas in the United States, persons over 65 are expected to grow to be almost 90 million of our population by the year 2050. This is why we need to start paying attention to this population and investigating the age-related skin changes, which make older persons more vulnerable to skin breakdown, incurring functional and financial costs. Next slide. So as I am only beginning in my research career, I'm starting to think about why this matters and the population is living longer and therefore having more chronic illness. Health researchers need to be curious and investigate how disease states intersect with aging. Uh, I should have mentioned that my background is that I'm a clinical nurse specialist in wound and ostomy, as well as a, a CCU nurse in a um, cardiac ICU. And I began to think about why we don't consider changes in skin and breakdown in skin with the same weight of other organ dysfunction. When we, can, when we think about skin as an organ, and it's our largest organ, it actually can be the window into how our overall health is doing. Um, so... As, um, as we think about that, we need to be thinking how do, and be curious about how do disease states intersect with aging skin? Why does everyone age, but not everyone's skin fails? And what can we learn from those whose skin doesn't fail? Consider the example of diabetes. Diabetes with the disease itself incurs microvascular changes, which are inherent um, to the disease. And as a person with diabetes ages, and aging skin naturally undergoes an, a reduction of microvascular reactivity, it would make sense that those patients have higher risk of developing skin breakdown, but also that they would have poor uh, prolonged healing related to skin when wounds develop. We should be promoting skin health in young patients, starting with primary care offices and education of good skin hygiene. 
Who has access to good nutrition and food, paying attention to culture and the role it plays within skin care? As we seek to find answers to these questions of older patients, we may see a movement to start implementing not only care for preventative measures, but also considerations of what a skin what skin of elderly persons may tell us about their overall health and that can inform us with decisions going forward, especially in critical care and end of life situations. We may see that there is an opportunity to promote implementation of educational programs at local senior centers where we can start having these conversations and teaching more about skin care. Next slide. So the takeaway is the skin is an organ that changes profoundly over a person's lifetime, and the health of the skin plays a role in maintenance of overall health or vulnerability to illness. Clinicians can learn a lot about a person's overall health by assessing the health of their skin, and researchers need to start investigating the biologic changes and mechanisms by which aging impacts skin. In the face of significant growth of worldwide aging populations, this work is really truly an opportunity to impact and improve older person's overall health. Thank you. All right, great job, Jackie. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Corrigan, and my research is on the impact of menopause on the mental health of women with intellectual disabilities. My background is in maths and psychology, and I work for IDS TILDA, the Intellectual Disability Supplement to the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. It is a longitudinal study that looks at health predictors of aging in an older intellectual disability population in Ireland. So a little bit of background to this study. So for those of you who are not familiar, intellectual disability is defined as problems with intellect, having problems with intellectual and adaptive functioning. So think about how difficult it is to go through the menopause as a woman from the general population. Having an intellectual disability just adds just another layer of complexity to the problem. Women with intellectual disabilities have historically been marginalized and ostracized by an old fashioned and Catholic Ireland under the Lunacy Regulation Act of 1871. They are often infantilized in terms of their sexual and reproductive health. So I have chosen to look at the mental health impact of the menopause on these women for two main reasons. So the first one is there is a strong link between the menopause and the mental health in the general population. So mental health symptoms such as anxiety and depression. And secondly, there are higher rates of mental illness in women with an intellectual disability. So my methodology, I'm gonna follow a mixed methods explanatory sequential design. And there are four main stages to my study. So the first one was a scoping review. And I conducted a systematic search of a variety of databases and gray literature sources, and I only came up with eight papers. And the eight papers were all following the same qualitative methodology. And while they all mentioned the impact of menopause on the mental health of women with intellectual disability, none of these papers had it at the, as their main focus. So the main findings were fairly general, but there were there was some evidence to suggest that there are changes in mood and behaviors of women with an intellectual disability around the time of the menopause. And also the main thing was that any psychological symptoms that were found were actually not reported. And if they were reported, it was really difficult to attribute them to the menopause. So these symptoms are going unrecognized and people are not getting the care that they need. And there's also a risk of dual diagnosis, which we know is and diagnostic overshadowing, which we know is a huge problem amongst this population. So I think the scoping review really pointed towards the need for this kind of generalizable quantitative research so that we can really establish what symptoms are faced by women with an intellectual disability when they go through the menopause. And these are just a few papers that were in my study. And then um, for the quantitative part of my study, I'm using data from wave five of the IDS TILDA study. And I collected this data as part of a wider group of researchers. And so of the menopausal women in this sample, only 41.2% reported any symptoms of the menopause. So among these women, 45.2%, among the people that actually reported symptoms, 45.2% actually reported mood changes in relation to the menopause, and 29.8% reported anxiety. And when we looked a little bit deeper, comparing postmenopausal women with premenopausal women, we found that there was a higher prevalence of mental health conditions in postmenopausal women compared to the premenopausal women. However, when we looked at this in a bit more detail in a regression model, the, the results were not significant. Um, 
then we looked at the behaviors of these women and we compared post menopausal women with pre menopausal women. And there was a higher incidence of um, aggressive, destructive behaviors amongst the women who were post menopausal compared to the women who were pre menopausal. Again, this wasn't significant. So the sample that we have was, is an aging sample. So there's a large proportion of postmenopausal women versus a quite a small group of premenopausal women. So I will look to make better comparisons with groups such as the general population to the TILDA study to see what we can do there. And also I will be conducting a longitudinal analysis as well. So for the last part of my project, I want to really go in depth into a more qualitative investigation and I really want to speak to these women and figure out what it is they experience when they go through the menopause and to find out the mental health implications from them themselves. So obviously to do this, I will need to make an ethics application and I'll need to speak to the PPI panel in our centre. And I really want to know what is the best way to approach these interviews and, you know, because it's a very sensitive topic. And so obviously the most important part of my study is going to be the dissemination. So I really want to make sure that the people who need this this information will benefit from it so i really want to make easy to read materials for these women so that they can understand the symptoms and then they can seek the help that they need and then also for their ca caregivers and healthcare providers so to see that um they will be able to recognize these symptoms in these women as well and finally i think we've come quite far in terms of women's health over the years however recently women with intellectual disabilities are still being um, left behind. In the recent Women's Health Strategy of 2022, women's women with an intellectual disability were not mentioned. So I think we really need to keep advocating for these women and we really need to keep including them in research and hopefully then we can improve their um, healthcare outcomes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Another fabulous presentation. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Kat Lodetto. Kat, when you are ready, you can unmute yourself and let me know when you'd like me to advance your slides. Yeah. Hi, I'm Catherine Lodetto. I'm a fourth year PhD student um, in nursing. This is a bit of a full circle moment as I used to walk by Trinity every day um, when I was working as a staff nurse in Ireland. <laughs> Little did I know I'd be presenting today. Um, my dissertation is on multi-level factors associated with intent to stay in US nursing home nurses. Um, lack of nursing home nurse retention is at a crisis level and requires immediate intervention, especially with the predicted increase in nursing home residents. Next slide. What we know is intention to stay is associated with manager, organizational, work, and nurse characteristics. It's also, and sorry, nurse characteristics are such things as age, ethnicity, race, sex, marital status, degree type, and personal circumstances. It's also associated with organizational commitment, nurse autonomy and empowerment, job satisfaction, healthy work environments. Um, Cowden and Cummings' intent to stay model is the theoretical basis of my dissertation and contains many of these concepts. Nurse professional practice work environments affect patient outcomes. Why is this important? It's, imp it's paramount to ensure good quality care to optimize the well-being of older adults in nursing homes to reduce the outcome measures of morbidity, mortality, and uh, um, hospitalization. Next slide. Most of the research on intent to stay has only been in hospital nurses. Little is known about why nursing home nurses stay, even in adverse conditions such as the pandemic, lack of leadership, and low level of autonomy. So what don't we know? What factors might be missing? Is there a concept missing? Is there something more? Are predictors different in long-term care setting? Next slide. My first manuscript is Predictors of Nurse Characteristics on Intent to Leave in U.S. Nursing Home Nurses. It's a secondary data analysis of the 2020 National Nursing Workforce Survey. It's funded by GAPNA. This sample included both licensed practical nurses in the United States, that's usually an 18-month to two-year associate degree, and registered nurses, which is important as LPNs outnumber RNs three to one in the nursing home. The question asked, do you plan to retire or leave nursing in the next five years? My sample was limited to age 57 or less to limit for nurses not retiring and direct care nurses only. 
And just to review the Cowden and Cummings intent to stay model, this manuscript focuses on this one block of nurse characteristic predictors of ITS in hospital nurses. Increased tenure and age is associated with intent to stay, but in my study it was the opposite. Increased age and increased tenure were associated with intent to leave. Next slide. This is my second manuscript, which was born out of my observations while sitting at the nursing home nurse's station desk. I'm a proud gerontological nurse practitioner. It's titled Role of Professional Fulfillment on Nursing Home Nurse Intent to Stay, a Narrative Review. Missing from the intent to stay theory is nurse-patient relationship. We know job fulfillment and satisfaction positively correlate with intent to stay. There is no research on intent to stay and caring. So the first step is to find out if there's an association between professional fulfillment and intent to stay. The method was articles were searched for fulfillment measures or self-report and nurses working with the adult population. The article concepts were organized according to the intent to stay theory concepts and Watson's characters process. The findings were fulfillment, intent to stay, and caring are associated. And the recommendation is that fulfillment should be integrated into future models. Next slide. So what are my next steps? I contemplate is the concept of caring fulfillment associated with intent to stay. I also am planning on doing a secondary analysis on the 2022 National Nursing Workforce Survey, which was collected after the pandemic. Thank you. Fabulous job, job, Kat. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Hi, good afternoon, all, and uh, good morning, Boston. Uh, my name is Sebastian uh, Penekel Philip. I'm uh, a PhD researcher uh, at Trinity College Dublin, and I'm an assistant lecturer at uh, ATU Donegal here in uh, Ireland. Uh, my study is about uh, anxiety and depression in heart failure. The study is titled Understanding the Longitudinal Impact of Anxiety and Depression on Heart Failure Patients, and it's a trajectory analysis. And I'm so proud to be here, and I, I, I'm so proud in one way that a wide variety of studies are here, like uh, I could hear from DIFFNS and ID and mental health and plenty of, and not like, it's just like a kaleidoscope and uh, no study is similar to anyone. Like it's very wide variety of studies. I'm so proud to hear that. Um, uh, as you all may be aware, like anxiety and depression are one of uh, our two uh, very common comorbidities that comes along with the heart failure. Uh, almost 20 to 45 percent of the heart failure patients have uh, depression, and depression is linked uh, to high mortality and increased hospitalization and worsening heart failure and poor quality of life. Uh, in the same way, uh, the anxiety also have almost uh, prevalent, almost 20 to 45 percent of the people with heart failure, and anxiety is uh, linked to poor quality of life. And there are plenty of conflicting evidences on mortality and increased hospitalization. So I'm trying to bring these two mental health factors together uh, on the heart failure population. So uh, I have plenty of research objectives. Uh, so I'm trying to study what are the main impacts of anxiety and depression on uh, people with heart failure. And my main outcomes are uh, uh, the mortality over one year and uh, the number of hospital admit, uh, admissions and the health related quality of life. Uh, this is a longitudinal study over one year and all the site approval is a multi site study uh, conducted uh, in uh, four uh, sites in the west and uh, northwest coast of Ireland and all the ethics approvals and data protection approvals uh, are received and I have started the data collection and recruitment. So uh, I'm using a couple of tools for anxiety and depression uh, assessment for anxiety. I'm using generalized anxiety uh, disorder seven questionnaire and uh, for depression patient health questionnaire nine and health related quality of life. I'm using Minnesota living with heart failure questionnaire and I'm collecting the demographic and clinical uh, data. And the new element in the study is at, uh, doing the trajectory analysis. I'm trying to make uh, the trajectory subclasses of anxiety and depression. Uh, uh, in patients with a heart failure, so I can identify heterogeneous patient subgroups. So uh, not all patients are same, and you know their their uh, their their anxiety depression symptoms will be varying uh, over the course of time. So I'm trying to uh, 
collect the anxiety and depression data every four months or one year and uh, trying to make a trajectory. So that will help uh, um, uh, a deep understanding of uh, longitudinal changes, as well as uh, it will help in making product prediction and risk assessment models. And also uh, it will help us uh, doing the statistical modeling uh, of the longitudinal data. And obviously these kinds of predictions will definitely help uh, with the gating intervention and treatment strategies. So uh, the study is in the initial stage. Hopefully uh, in the next conference, I would be able to present my findings. And thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. That was great. Um, next up, we have Nikki Burney. Nikki, when you're ready, you can unmute and just let me know when you want me to advance. OK, um, so good morning to all who are here in Boston and good afternoon to those who are in Ireland. My name is Nikki Burney, and I am a nurse practitioner in the hospital setting. I work in the diabetes management setting, and I've been in the hospital for my entire nursing career. And so the focus of my dissertation research will be diabetes outcomes among patients and workers in hospital settings. Next slide. The overall aim of my dissertation research is to help better understand how hospitals contribute to the societal burden of diabetes. Diabetes is still largely considered an outpatient problem, with hospitals really rescuing patients from failed or ineffective outpatient therapies. As someone who's in the hospital taking care of patients with diabetes, I see that we often fail to live up to this uh, reputation. There's emerging data that in the hospital, clinicians have difficulty utilizing evidence-based guidelines for the management of hospitalized patients with diabetes, or they fail to de-adopt harmful practices. We know that for the length of time that patients are in the hospital, whether it's one day, two days, or 30 days, their blood sugar control matters. If they have poor control, either too low or too high, they're at increased risk for a longer hospital stay. They're more likely to be transferred to the intensive care unit. They're less likely to be discharged home. There's difficulty with healing, there's problems also with an increased likelihood of in-hospital death. On the level of the worker, we know that there are multiple occupational exposures that increase the risk of diabetes, including shift work, long hours, and job stress. This phenomenon has been largely understudied. And so there are implications for how things are done in the hospital that impact both workers and patients. And as you can see in this image, there's also emerging theoretical frameworks that are beginning to etch out the ways that work impact worker health and workers because they control the quality of care and they use themselves to care for patients, worker outcomes impact patient outcomes. And these theories have really informed my research questions. Next slide. And so I'm in the process of working on three studies that are in various stages. And so in the first study, I'm leading a systematic review to look at how omissions in care, inappropriate inaction, impacts blood sugar control among hospitalized patients. And what the preliminary findings show are that guideline non-adherence is widespread. The data that we're seeing is that patients that are have Omissions in their care are more likely to have high blood sugars as opposed to low blood sugars, but both are problematic. However, unfortunately, there are still a lot of gaps in what leads to suboptimal hospital care. We don't understand the context in which these things happen. We don't also understand how nursing um, contributes to patient care, even though nurses are the primary caregivers of hospitalized patients and provide the bulk of diabetes care to patients. In the second study that I'm working on, I am doing a secondary analysis of a 6,000 sample of hospital workers to determine the prevalence and likelihood of type 2 diabetes in the workforce. And what the preliminary findings are showing is that when we look at workers by their job category, support workers, those who are non-clinical workers, such as housekeepers or secretaries, have higher rates of type 2 diabetes compared to nurses. We see that those workers who are full-time or part-time have higher rates of diabetes compared to those who are per diem. When we look by wage, we see that workers who are paid the lowest wage have the highest prevalence of diabetes, but this is followed 
by workers with the highest wage, which um, is an interesting finding that requires more research. When we think about demographic categories, some of the patterns that we see in the general US population are also seen in these hospital workers with workers that are older, that are male, and workers of color having the highest rates of type two diabetes. The third study that I hope to do is still in the process of being developed, but it hopes to be a system level look at the actual hospital environment, specifically looking at the working conditions of inpatient nursing staff and non-critical care units and seeing the relationship with how well it predicts glycemic outcomes among inpatients. Next slide. And so in summary, I hope from my dissertation to provide evidence that shows that omissions in inpatient diabetes and glycemic care are common in hospitals. They do have implications for patient outcomes. They also are likely to have implications for access to care and healthcare costs, given that diabetes is one of the top 10 most expensive conditions to treat in the hospital setting. What we still don't understand are the context in which suboptimal care happens and taking that systems level view will be really important for not just understanding when it happens, but what are the environments that are allowing it to happen. I also hope to provide evidence that type two diabetes appears to be affecting nurses and other healthcare workers in an uneven way, which may be related to social determinants of health and occupational exposures. Of note, trends among workers that are older, that are male and persons of color have implications for an aging and increasingly diverse nursing workforce. And then lastly, by taking more of a systems level analysis of the relationship between working conditions for nursing staff and patients, I hope to begin to speak to some of the impact of nursing on diabetes outcomes in the hospital as primary caregivers of hospitalized patients, and also to begin to describe how conducive real world inpatient settings are for the provision of guideline concordant care. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Nikki. And David. Hello to everybody in Dublin and to Boston. Um, just over the next five minutes, my um, PhD study is entitled Unraveling Social Connection, a narrative study um, unraveling connection in the lives of older gay men in Ireland. So over the next five minutes, I hope to take you on a whistle stop journey of what social connection is and what it means to older gay people in Ireland today. Um, I suppose my supervisors are Professor Anne-Marie Brady and Professor Brian Keogh. And I suppose just to kick off, um, just to talk to you a little bit about connection in its different forms that we see all around the planet. So I suppose we see from coming up to Christmas, penguins up on the screen there, from, you know, when they pick a mate, they stay together for life, they demonstrate a kind of a, an intimate or a companion type connection. To more primates and hardly known for their larger brains, they demonstrate they're able to seek out hierarchy in animal kingdom and they're able to, to kind of socially connect. To more funny kangaroos that you see on screen there that demonstrate connection as attachment in early life to their, to their, to their joeys when they're born. To humankind, mankind, probably the most inherent kind of social species that we see across the planet. Um, connection is really all around this. Social relationships, our connection is really, really important. It's one of our most basic human needs. So what connection means for my study and what's the social connection, I suppose, to con conceptualize it for, for this research, I use Holt's model of social connection. So it's a, an umbrella term, I suppose, that incorporates things like social cohesion and um, social support. Um, when we talk about disconnection, loneliness, isolation, all of those different things. But social connection, I suppose, is the umbrella term where it looks at relationships, quality, function and the structure of those relationships. So it's an umbrella positive health term that kind of incorporates structure, function and quality of our social health. Um, it's one of our most basic human needs, you know, um, from, from attachment, from birth, from womb to tomb. It, it appears in many different disciplines and they, they, they talk about it under many different types of headings um, from, you know, from the health arena to the psychological arena to the emotional arena. Uh, looking at older gay men, why look at, uh, I suppose, social connection in older gay men and why is it important? Because I suppose for um, there's limited research with older gay men and for this portion of the population, 
it's you know these were people that were criminalized stigmatized stigmatized um where homosexuality was viewed as an illness so social connection has been um documented as difficult in this um portion of the population of the lgbtqa population um, the research is quite limited. The only Irish research on um, LGBTQIA was actually uh, in older gay people was Higgins, Agnes Higgins, um, actually from Trinity College here. That was done back in two thousand and eleven, and that was the last kind of kind of kind of big study that was kind of kind of done within the Irish context. Um, just to briefly just give a little bit of an overview um, of the legislative changes of homosexuality within Ireland. From 1993, we saw the decriminalisation of homosexuality to, you know, 2008, the Employment Equality Act, 2010, the passing of civil partnership, 2015, the marriage referendum. So we've seen quite in the last 20 years, Ireland become a more liberal and to everyone who's in Boston as well, it's a more, you know, a more liberal Ireland, but we've seen quite a large amount of change within the last 20 years um, here within Ireland. So to bring you back to my research, looking at connection, looking at the population, the aim of the research, I suppose it's to explore older gay men's experiences of social connection, their experiences and perceptions, and also to look at the barriers and facilitators of social connection across their life. I have used uh, as a methodology a uh, narrative, which is both an analytical framework and a methodology within its, within its own right, where we kind of uh, humans look at stories from stories when we think of our first fairy tale we heard from a child to maybe when we've had a grandparent or someone who's passed on that they live on and their memories are we live story filled lives and take meaning from those stories. Um, my philosophical underpinning is social constructionism, just to just to mention it being a, a PhD, <laughs> a, a doctor in um, uh, philosophy and um, my research uh, approach and design is exploratory inductive research it's a qualitative approach using the narrative methodology as mentioned and I use the sample size of 10 older gay men because the sample size is smaller within narrative but it, there's a lot of a lot of depth to kind of get the rich this discourse and the rich studies that have come out of this research Currently on my findings within the within the um, the research within the PhD, and my findings are kind of looking at telling these older gay men stories within a within a kind of a, a collective narrative. Um, I suppose I looked at two. Uh, Liebix was my um, my data analysis framework. Um, I used holistic content and holistic form. So one aspect of the analysis actually looked into the content of the stories, and then the other aspect was more of a, a form, so a structural analysis that looked at things like the start, middle, middle and end of the story, the untold story, the characters in the story, the protagonist, the main characters, the antagonist, the, you know, the, the, maybe the enemy that appears in the story, and how that gives meaning to the story as analysis, as well as the content. And this kind of formed kind of three chapters that tell the collective story of this kind of global story that give meaning um, of, of the older gay men's experiences of connection. So it's looking at like three chapters at the minute, I'm at the finding stage. It, um, the first chapter is a weakening of the foundations needed for social connection, the fitting in, the living in the shadows, and then the third chapter of the findings is out of the shadows. Um, just a very, very brief overview of my findings, what it's looking like. I suppose the title of the, the 10 stories collectively is a journey living in and out of the shadows, turning points in social connection on a journey to self-acceptance as an older gay man. And some of the findings, five minutes today, I could talk about this for a very long time, but just to give you a little bit of an overview as you see on the screen there. Um, milestones in progress to date. I'm kind of jap um, hoping to submit in um, August of, of, uh, of next year. I've drafted kind of chapters one to seven and ongoing thesis writing like a lot of people in a lot of presentations today. I'm sure a lot of people in Boston can, can, can relate to this as well. Um, thank you. And there's my email if anybody has any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another fabulous presentation. So next we'll switch to Amy Go. Amy, when you're ready, you can go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy Go. I go by the she, her pronouns. I'm a certified nurse midwife and a PhD candidate um, at Boston College. Um, my chair uh, and advisor is Dr. Joyce Edmonds. And community members and mentors are Dr. Chris Lee and Tam Nguyen. Next slide, please. It's a little bit um, about my um, presentation. Um, looking at um, patient provider communication um, and patient portal use in pregnant people of color. Um, so systemic racism and equitable distribution of resources has really contributed to the perinatal health disparities in the United States. Um, pregnant people of color, particularly black pregnant people and indigenous people of color 
have three to four higher rates of maternal mortality compared to their white counterparts in the United States. Additional studies, such as the Giving the Voice to Mothers study, um, which was performed in the NFDVR sample in the US, um, have demonstrated poor quality of communication between pregnant people of color and their prenatal providers. However, studies done in um, oncology and diabetes research have really shown promising results um, in improving communication via digital health technologies, such as the patient portal. Though there have been some studies looking at the patient portal um, in pregnancy, there really has been no study that looked at um, improving communication via digital um, via patient um, the patient portal in pregnant people of color. Therefore, the purpose of my PhD research is to examine the relationship between patient portal use, quality of patient provider communication, and digital health literacy in pregnant people of color. Next slide, please. The guiding framework um, that I've used um, in my PhD study is the public health critical race praxis. Um, which is um, a framework that has been developed for uh, to really apply critical race theory to health equity research. And the crux of this framework really looks at race, race consciousness, which is the same as critical race theory, where one really examines how race inter interfaces with multiple levels of society, institutions, relationships, and even within the ind individual. Next slide. There's three aims um, in, my, in my PhD research. The first was to complete um, an integrative review. Um, the next, um, um, what, sorry, the next was to quantify the relationships between patient portal use, patient red communication, and digital health literacy in pregnant people of color. And the third study aim was to identify the facilitators and barriers to quality communication in pregnant people of color. Next slide, please. In my first um, study aim, I completed um, an integrative review um, looking at communication between pregnant people of color and prenatal providers. Um, this manuscript was published this year, um, and it looked at 26 um, articles. Uh, and the main findings were two, there were two overarching themes, which were racism and discrimination and unmet information needs. There were several sub-themes looking at the factors, outcomes, and recommendations. Um, you can scan this QR code to look at the open access article. Next slide, please. The next study um, for my research, um, which covers AIMS 2 and 3, um, is a multi-method cross-sectional survey design. Um, this, was funded by, this is funded by the NIH NIR F31 pre-doctoral grant. Um, I completed, um, uh, I recruited 130 pregnant people of color um, from the largest safety net hospital in New England um, who were at least 30, 20 weeks gestation receiving prenatal care um, at this institution. Um, the, it consisted of participants completing a survey of three different measures. The first measure was the Mothers on Respect Index, um, which uh, measured patient provider communication. Patient portal usage um, was determined by several questions uh, inquiring about usage of the patient portal, whether patients had downloaded and utilized the patient portal, if they had actually sent a direct message, or if they just engaged with the portal without sending a direct message. And then two other tools that measurements that were used um, measure digital health literacy. The first one was a digital health literacy instrument, and the second was the e-health literacy scale, or the e-heals. Um, there were also um, several questions, demographic questions, and then four qualitative questions within that survey. Next slide, please. So here are some pre preliminary data. Um, as you can see from this um, pie chart, the majority of participants were self-identified as Black or African American. Um, they held insurance through MassHealth, which is the Massachusetts public insurance. A majority had um, midwives as their primary um, prenatal provider. The majority of participants had initiated care in the first trimester. 19% 19, 19 identified as Hispanic. The average age participants was around 29 and the average gestational age um, in which the survey was completed around was 31 weeks. In terms of the scales, um, the scores for the MORI, which was the Mother's Own Respect Index, um, which measured patient variety communication, the, they averaged on the higher end of um, reporting levels of respect. And additionally, there were higher levels of digital health literacy based on the eHills and the DHL and HLI scores. You can see here also from this map, um, I also collected zip code data. So you can see the concentration and whereabouts within Massachusetts and even um, New Hampshire and Rhode Island where participants um, actually came from. So I'll continue to complete my analysis um, of, my, of the surveys and I plan to complete my PhD next year. 
I also plan to continue to doing this research and work towards birth equity, and I hope you'll continue to follow my work around digital health literacy and pregnancy. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Amy. And that brings our session for today to a close. So for those of you in here in Dublin, I wish you a wonderful afternoon. And for those of you in Boston, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and good morning. Um, I love sessions like this, especially with PhD student work. And it uh, is just reaffirming to me that the future of our science and our discipline as an intellectual discipline is in incredibly phenomenal hands. So congratulations to all of you. Absolutely wonderful work. And uh, uh, thanks, yeah, thanks, Chris, for that. And I, I just want to to agree with Chris on the the the. I mean, it's it's wondrous and and mind blowing to to see the 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 depth of work, but also the breadth of work that's being done, not just across all, I suppose, realities of human life and existence, but also across all methodologies and and perspectives. So I, I want to congratulate all those who've, who've spoken today and contributed. I wish you all the very best in your in your work going forward. Um, I think this is a really a wonderful wonderful event to have. Um, I remember my own, and I won't bore you, but my own PhD journey was a was a, a lonely journey, uh, as it was for many of us who were the the early PhD um, um, students in uh, particularly in nursing and midwifery in Ireland. Um, but to have communities like this coming together, whether in person or, or in hybrid ways, is so sus sustaining for the future of, uh, of, edu of education and research in these areas. So I'd like to thank you. I'd also like to just, uh, as well as thanking Chris and, 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 and those who presented, I want to thank our own Director of Research, uh, Sharon O'Donnell, for, for her work here and in bringing this together with Chris, but also those who've made this uh, uh, event take place here, um, particularly Jenny Ryan and also Elizabeth O'Shaughnessy, who've been central to organizing this. And those who are, are here, I'd like to invite them downstairs to the foyer to uh, a small reception. And, um, and I look forward to having the opportunity to talk to those who are here and maybe some stage come over and meet you over in Boston College and uh, get a chance to talk to you in person. Thank you. <laughs>